We'll begin reading at verse 1. I'll read to verse 4, and, uh, and we'll get into our study. Romans chapter 14, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 4. Paul writes, Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Hmm. <laughs> let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has received him. Who are you to judge another man's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he'll be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. So, Paul is now moving into a portion of his letter to teach us how to treat someone who is what would be called weak in the faith. When he speaks concerning that, notice verse 1, he says, receive one who is weak. That word weak means feeble, weak, infirm, without strength. It speaks about powerless. So he's speaking here and he's saying, receive one who is without strength. Receive one who is powerless. The word receive is an important word. It means to accept. It speaks of associating with this person. It means receive him into fellowship. And so as we're trying to find a, a, a context, why would Paul be writing like this at this point? He may be writing concerning the Jew who has been converted. He would be weak in the faith if he considered meat and festival days essential for salvation. And so when he says, receive one who is weak in the faith, I want to develop that for just a moment, just touch on this. The faith may be, uh, I'm sorry, the faith is not speaking of the faith to be saved. It's not speaking about the exercising of your faith. He's not saying that. When he speaks of in the faith, that speaks of, and that's a phrase that is used in various places, uh, speaking of the entire body of doctrine that is revealed to us in Scripture. The faith is a term speaking of our doctrine, everything that has been given to us. I'll give you a couple of examples just to illustrate that. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world, resist him standing strong in the word of God. That's how you resist the devil, not just trying to have all this faith. Oh, I got faith. I... No, it's, it's used in Scripture. Like when Jesus was speaking to Satan, and he said, it is written. So <laughs> when you're resisting the devil, you're doing so steadfast in the faith, all revealed doctrine that we understand God by. In 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, the Spirit expresses, speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So in the last days, people will no longer cling to orthodox Christian theology. We see that today. And then Jude, in verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write to you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write to you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. And so as he's speaking here, receive one who is weak in the faith. Receive one who hasn't matured yet in his understanding of Christian doctrine. The one who's still weak or infirm, who hasn't learned yet how to put his faith into practice. So Christians are still young in their spiritual growth. That's the point he's making. They have tender consciences uh, that haven't yet understood what it means to be free in Christ. And that's what he means when he speaks about the uh, doubtful things or the disputable matters. So he's saying, do not reject any from your Christian communion because of their feelings on things which are in themselves indifferent or not important to salvation. Now, the thing he's dealing with here in Rome seems to have been common because it was something similar that was occurring in the churches or the church at Corinth. Now, when he wrote to them, they had questions concerning food that had been offered to idols. <laughs> and in chapter 8, he said that an idol is nothing at all in the world because he says, we know that there's only one God. 
But still, not everyone has the knowledge that food doesn't bring us near to God. So he went on to say in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 9, Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. In chapter 10, later in the same book, in verses 23 and 24, he went on to say, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify, not all things build up. And he went on to say, let no one seek his own, but each, the, each one the other's well-being. So there's a principle we're going to be looking at in just a minute. But the principle, and it's, I call it Christianity 101, basic Christianity, is love one another. Love one another and don't cause each other to stumble. Don't be arguing over things that don't matter. That's what we're going to be looking at today. You see, a truly mature believer isn't going to cause a tenderhearted believer to stumble. Their tenderness, he's saying, mustn't be met with mean-spirited opposition. You see, I'll try to make it a little practical for us. In our day, uh, people who are convicted can react to conviction in interesting and sometimes hurtful ways. They may speak to you if you say something to them. Um, they may say something like, um, uh, you think you're too good. Who do you think you are to judge me? Um, they may even try to embarrass you, uh, try to, to say, what's wrong with you? Haven't you grown up? With, what's the big deal about this? I've seen that. If you don't like it, they may say, well, that's just too bad. You know, grow up. I think that's the most common thing I've heard in, in most recent years is if you don't like it, that's too bad. I must be true to myself. And if you stumble or have a problem with that, well, grow up. That's kind of the attitude a lot of people seem to have today. Some believers understand grace and freedom in Jesus to be something called permission. So in, in the name of grace, they, they feel at liberty to do almost everything. I just wrote a few things down. Let's see who gets hit and gets mad at me. But this is what's going on. We all know this. And they do things in the name of grace. It's, it's God's grace. And you, you're a legalist. You're trying to control me. They do it in, in the name of grace. So those, and I can tell you this, there are, there are young pastors that I'm aware of who uh, enjoy their social drinks and their cigars. You know, young people who think they're deep because they read some older writer and they sit there with their friends with their cigars, blowing smoke rings and with their brandy. And they're very deep. And they think that that's cool. Sometimes people will post photos of themselves. You know, here I am at the beach and they're, they're wearing a real immodest bathing suit. And I've tried to tell those guys, stop that. It's, it's, <laughs> it's really gross. Very embarrassing. Sometimes they dress immodestly and they post that. There are, there are believers who think it's cool to swear because they think that's being real. They even argue with you and say, where's the Bible say I can't? Um, here's something for some of you who will know and others of us won't. Um, there's a, um, an entertainer named Cardi B. How many of you know that name? I'm, I'm, I'm truly interested. See, I, yeah, the younger ones. Okay. Uh, it wasn't that long ago. I'll just kind of give you something you probably know, but not that long ago. There was a big uh, stink about some song that came out, I think, in the 40s. Baby, It's Cold Outside, which I've always thought was a stupid song. I've never liked this song. I thought it was stupid the first time I heard it, and I wasn't even saved. But I knew it was about seduction. I mean, anybody who's got a brain knows that. Baby, it's cold outside. And so people got in an uproar, right? And they banned it. You couldn't play that song. Well, I don't, I don't care, but they banned it. But the same people who were banning Baby, it's cold outside because it was suggestive and because it was... Uh, um, something misogynistic and things like that. Uh, they're the same ones who, who propelled Cardi B's, and I wouldn't even say the name of the song, and you guys all, those of you who knew her name, you guys all know that, and some of you probably even know the lyrics. I didn't know the lyrics, but I looked them up. They're nasty. I want, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand but I bet you there are Christians in this room who think that song's okay. I bet you there are some in our room or listening right now who didn't go to offended by it. You see, that's what's interesting to me. 
is that sometimes we make issues over things that really don't matter, and the things that do, we permit. And what happens is it creates problems. And so they say, well, wait a minute, I'm under, under grace. Listen, I, that's why I don't come to Bible studies. Old people like you make me feel dirty. No, that's called conviction. See, that's the Holy Spirit who's saying, it's wrong, you little stinker. It's wrong. <laughs> and you know that it's wrong. But on the other hand, we need to understand that because they may think these things are permissible and okay and all of that. Well, that doesn't call their salvation into question. I would never say that person's unsaved because, because, because grace does cover that. And we do grow and we do mature and we do learn over time. And so the Bible tells us so very, very clearly to avoid these things. Remember in chapter 13, verses 13 and 14, let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry or drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill his lust. That's what scripture says. So it's really not me, an old man pastor that somebody has a problem with. Their problem is with the scripture because the scripture prohibits that and Christians ought to be aware of that. It's that simple. So I don't make judgments on those people because, you know what, they're growing up. And as they grow closer to Jesus, those things are things they, they let go of. So that's one hand. But on the other hand, many believers, or some at least, have a difficult time receiving grace. They don't know what grace is. And, and what that propels them to do is, is to never go to a movie, uh, never watch TV, uh, never to listen to secular music, never to eat uh, pork, you know, chicharron. I mean, I don't know what's wrong with you. <laughs> they, they will hate tattoos. I mean, there are those who will argue with you. That's a, a sign of the beast or it's a evil. I mean, they, they'll argue with you. There are those who will say um, that women shouldn't wear jewelry, that they should never wear uh, pants, uh, and they should never wear uh, makeup. And they'll never get married. You know, um, <laughs> so you, what, what's that old saying, if the, bar, if the barn needs paint? <laughs> paint it. <laughs> uh, okay, let's keep going. Um, now, you might think these things are fine. I have no problem with it, obviously. But they don't. So a truly mature believer won't cause them to stumble over arguing over these kinds of things. What do we do? Well, verse 1 says, receive one who's weak in the faith, but not to disputes. Now, again, Paul would be referring to Jewish believers. They, they would have difficulty regarding Jewish festivals, ceremonial law. So he's saying, uh, welcome them into the fellowship. If the believers are solid, their moderation and love will be an encouragement to those who are still growing in their faith, and, and when they see the fruit of love and peace, that, that draws them into a greater appreciation of the grace of God. So he develops it in verse 2 by saying, One believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. So the one who is described as being weak is, is you know, for want of another word, a vegetarian. Uh, the mature brother or sister knows that they have freedom to eat, meat, but the others don't. So, verse 3, let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. So what do you do? He says, receive him. Don't despise him. That word despise means to hold in contempt. Don't hold him in contempt. He's your brother. And if he's saved, love him for Jesus' sake. But he goes on in verse 4 and he says, who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God's able to make him stand. So this can actually be directed to both the, the younger as well as the older believer. On one hand, God can work with a weak brother, so your responsibility as an older brother or sister is to receive him. But on the other hand, it can be directed to the weaker. Why are you judging them? See, neither one of them has the right to be the other's judge in these kinds of things. Remember in James 4.12, there is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who are you who judges another? So that isn't within the, the, my frame uh, or my pay grade. 
I am not to be judging people based on these, these things, these kinds of things. I'm to receive and love them, and by God's grace, they'll grow into maturity, and uh, we'll be able to, to fellowship on a deeper level over time. He says in verse 5, one person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. I have, happen to be one of those who esteems every day alike. You know, you worship God every day, not just Wednesdays and Sundays. So for me, there aren't no special days that, oh, I must, I, I want to worship him daily, but that's me. So one person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. He who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. So some feel that certain days of the week are more holy than other days. Let me share something that some of you will relate to. Others may not. Some of us grew up believing in what were called holy days of obligation. How many of you have heard that term? I'm curious. Just how many? A good portion of you. Holy days of obligation. How many of you were raised in the Catholic faith? Please. Well, those of you who didn't raise your hand the first time, you didn't go to catechism. So... <laughs> <laughs> uh, we were taught uh, not to eat meat on Fridays every day of the week, every Friday of the week for the calendar year. That's how I grew up. I grew up in the time when they had the Latin Mass. Some of you know what I'm saying, others may not. Tridentine Mass, the Latin Mass. You'd go to church and they would say Latin phrases and you would just kind of sit there listening, because you really didn't know what they were saying. But we were taught to observe a certain day of the week, which was Friday, every day. Now, in 1966, that was changed. And they began to, Catholics began to be free to eat meat on Fridays, uh, except for Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. And still to this day, that's what's taking place. If you're above the age of 14, you, you are bound by what is called the law of abstinence. Now, when he's speaking about some days and some meats and foods, that can be translated in a practical way to remember how some of us were raised in the Catholic Church. We were raised that way. So my, the only way that you could eat meat on a Friday when I grew up is if you forgot that it was Friday. <laughs> That's true. How many of you remember that from your catechism, right? We forgot every Friday. It was just an amazing thing how my, my memory went bad every Friday. It really did. Now, now, Paul deals with this in Colossians 2. Listen to what he says in verses 16 and 17. He said, therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. He said, these are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. These were things pointing to Jesus. So Paul is making it clear. Some people won't eat. Some people do. They're both doing it for conscience sake, and they're both doing it as unto the Lord. That's what he's saying. So each one of them is doing this in his own way in honor of God. So he moves on in verse 7. None of us lives to himself. No one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we're the Lord's. We, we belong to him. It's not the food that we consec consecrate to the Lord. It's ourselves. It's our lives. That's the point he's making. No one belongs entirely to themselves. We belong to Jesus. How's that? Well, a believer understands that we have been bought at a price. In 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20, this is what Paul said. You are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's, which belong to God. He redeemed us. He purchased us by the blood of Christ. So we don't belong entirely to ourselves. We belong entirely to the Lord, and that's the point he's making. No one, uh, no one of us lives to himself. No one dies to himself. We live to the Lord. We die to the Lord. Whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. 4, verse 9, to this end, Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. 
So through his resurrection, he's the Lord of those who are alive and those who have died. They belong to him. You see, the resurrection, when he says he is the Lord, the resurrection established Jesus' claim to deity. In Romans 1, we saw it at verse 4. Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power, he said, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So we belong to him. So he continues on in verse 10, and he says, but why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we all shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it's written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. It's easy for believers to pass judgment on one another over many things. What's interesting is even the Apostle Paul was judged by believers. You might remember 1 Corinthians 4, 3, and 4. I care very little if I'm judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It's the Lord who judges me. Isn't it interesting, and I'll say it quickly because this isn't in my notes, but it just... I find it interesting that these people, these Corinthians, actually had a group within the Corinthian church that were judging Paul. Can you imagine that? Making a judgment on the apostle Paul. Uh, in the same chapter later on, he says, uh, though you may have 10,000 teachers, yet you have but one father. I begot you in the gospel. You've been influenced by people to move in the direction of making judgment on me an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if the apostle Paul was judged by members of the Corinthian church, what makes us think that nobody's going to judge us? It just happens. And so it's important to remember, and this is the point he's making here, that we're going to stand before the throne, and we're not going to give an account for someone else's choices or behavior. There have been times, and this is a true story, it's true, that when I've been teaching in the uh, on a Sunday morning on, uh, on the topic of marriage. That's the most animated crowd I have, especially when I'm speaking to the husbands. You can see husbands. You can see, you know, sometimes people forget I can see them. And, and you, I've seen it where the wife will go and fold her arms and look at her husband. He's talking to you, right? And the husband, you know, you might get an elbow every once in a while. It happens. It really does. Or when I speak in the other to the husbands, you know, to the wives and all the husbands will look. It's funny. It's, 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 it's that kind of tape that people want to buy, that CD or whatever that people want to buy. Tape, boy, that was a throwback. A CD <laughs> that uh, people want to buy so they can give to somebody else because they need to hear this. Every, uh, here's, a, here's, here's something for us. Every Bible study is not for somebody next to me or behind me or in front of me. Every Bible study I give is first for me. I have to hear the word. It has processed through me. And then it's for us individually. So it's easy to point a finger at somebody else and say, did you hear that? When in reality, the spirit would be pointing at me saying, did you hear that? That's how you'll grow. By the way, we stop judging each other. Now, notice in verse 10, he says, believers are going to be judged uh, and receive. Uh, there's a judgment, but they're to receive rewards, not condemnation or punishment. Um, we stand before what is called the Bema seat, and we receive the rewards of, gra of grace-filled works. And the one who makes the judgment at the Bema seat, the judge, is Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he has done, whether it is good or bad. And when it says we must all appear, that word appear is an interesting word because it can sound like we're just standing there, but the word appear actually is the word where you get the word manifest from. Our hearts are going to be made manifest. It's not us just standing there, but we're going to see ourselves for who we are and what we've done. That's the kind of picture you have right there. But the one who is looking at us and observing us is Jesus. But as believers, 
because we've been washed by his blood and have been justified by him, we're not being judged with eternal punishment. We're there to receive our rewards. And that's how it will work at that time. And notice verse 11, he says, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. All are going to express submission and adoration, acknowledging him as God. In Philippians 2, Paul said it like this, verses 10 and 11. He said, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow heaven and on heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So that day is going to come, and I've said this before, it's true. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. I do that now. I do that now. I'm prepared to do it then. But there are those who refuse to do it now. But they will do it then. Every knee shall bow. Sigmund Freud is going to bow before Christ. He's going to say, oh, you're not an imaginary thing. Muhammad is going to bow before Jesus Christ. Buddha will bow before Jesus Christ. Keep that in mind. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that's the point he's making. Every knee. So he says in verse 12, each of us shall give account of himself to God. So be aware of your own shortcomings. Uh, our own failures should keep us occupied enough. Verse 13. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. Seeing that we're going to stand before Jesus in judgment, be very careful not to stumble somebody else. Don't tempt someone else to fall into sin. Let us love one another. Uh, I, I, I can speak uh, with personal experience on this from a personal testimony I've shared before, so I won't say much of it other than this. I had a friend who was raised in the Christian church. I wasn't. I didn't know the Lord from an early age. I got saved when I was 20. I was an alcoholic and drug abuser. Got saved. My friend was raised in the church. And when I was about 23... And I'd gotten out of the military. He said, you know what? I've never drank beer. I'm starting to learn to enjoy the taste of it. And so he and I went and were eating together. And in his encouragement, why not drink? I remember drinking and tasting the beer. And I remember thinking that my heart was stumbled over this. See, he didn't have an alcohol problem. He, he didn't have a habit. He didn't. He didn't do what I did. I, I, would, I would drink, and I don't want to say too much about this, other than I would drink because, one, I enjoyed it, but, two, it numbed me. And so it was, it was when I was drinking a lot that I got to a certain point in my, while I was drinking that I would actually say what I felt and feel what I felt. I don't know if anybody understands what I mean by that, but I would feel my feelings. That's a common phrase today. What I mean is, I let myself feel what I was not wanting to feel. And then I would very often get emotional. I could very easily, not always, but I could easily turn to tears if I thought long enough on the things that I'd been hurt by. Alcohol became my excuse. Alcohol gave me an opportunity to vent the things that I was feeling. When I came to faith in Christ, God began to heal those broken parts of my life. So I didn't need drinking anymore. I didn't need the alcohol anymore. And then my friend's saying, what's wrong with it? We're over 21. You're not getting drunk. And in tasting and drinking that beer, it didn't send me to hell, but it did give me um, pangs of conscience. It did remind me of the old life. It did remind me of how I once felt. It reminded me, I come home, if I had beer on my breath, I wouldn't want to be around my mom because she would smell it. It reminded me of those days. So, no, taking a glass of beer, which I didn't drink the whole beer, by the way, but taking a glass of beer isn't going to send me to hell. But it did cause me to have a guilty conscience. It did stumble me in my walk. And my dear friend who was older than me in the Lord, 
could have been a help to me instead of a hindrance. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is let's be wise in how we influence people. Because um, you may not have a drinking problem, but the one that you're encouraging to drink may very well have one. What are we to do? We love one another. He's saying don't entice a brother to enter what he believes to be sinful. Even if you think that you're helping them to mature by doing it. He says in verse 14, I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus there's nothing unclean of itself. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. So I want you to notice this identifies Paul with those who are not stumbled by foods. Remember in Mark 7, 15, how Jesus said there's nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. Remember how Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 3 and 4, speaking of people who were bringing them into bondage, he said, they forbid people to marry, order them to abstain from certain foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything that God created is good. Nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving. So he said, I know and I'm convinced by the Lord, Lord Jesus there's nothing unclean uh, of itself. He says, but in verse 14, to him who considers anything unclean, to him it is unclean. Well, what is it that stumbled the brother then? Well, if the brother considers it sin, then to him doing it will be sinful. Why? Because he's not eating with a clean conscience. And so he goes on, he says in verse 15, yet if your brother's grieved because of your food, you're no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Don't cause a brother to stumble. Uh, that's what keeps me from exercising my Christian liberty in an improper way. It's making the decision not to stumble a fellow Christian. You see, by giving up my liberties, I'm showing love to my brother. If my doing something grieves him, then for his sake, I won't do it. I tried to emphasize this as an illustration when this church was very new. And I was trying to say, and I, if I said it to you right now, you'll see what I meant. I, I said it this way. I said, listen, and this is when our church was like maybe uh, six months old or less. And it was a small fellowship, about 40 people, 50 people or whatever. And, and I was trying to illustrate, and I said, listen, you expect more of me as a pastor. I said, I, I don't want to stumble you. What would you do if I invited you to my house? and asked you to get something out of one of the cupboards or whatever, and you opened it up, and, and you saw a, a bottle of, of bourbon, what would you do? Well, that was just a question I was trying to illustrate. You'd probably be stumbled. I don't know. Maybe you wouldn't. I don't know. If, you came, if I was over here at one of the restaurants, and you walked up, I had a pitcher of beer, and I'm slamming them, and say, hey. <laughs> would it bother you? That's what I was saying. Would it bother you? What would you do? And this guy in the front row who was an alcoholic yelled out, in church, I'll help you drink it, pastor. <laughs> that wasn't the point I was trying to make. He probably would have too. You remember, John? Do you remember? <laughs> so by giving up our liberties in, in Christ, we're, we're showing love to our brothers or sisters. Um, my choices of food are not to be more important than my brother's faith. In verse 16, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. Don't let your freedom in Christ be used to make accusations concerning the way that you live. Verse 17, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. The kingdom of God is not certain distinctions of foods. It, uh, the kingdom of God is revealed by righteousness and peace and joy. Because that's the fruit of a clean conscience. Verse 18, for he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. The righteous life, the peace, the joy, and all is actually regarded by others. That's why 
Matthew 5, 16 says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And so you live in such a way because it brings glory to God. And that's how we are supposed to live. Verse 19, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the, and, uh, and the things by which one may edify another. Instead of bringing somebody down with my perceived liberties, how about me trying to bring somebody else up? Instead of insisting on my own rights, maybe I need to care for the condition of other people. You know, when it speaks concerning peace and all, I want you to see that verse 19. Let us pursue the things which make for peace. There, there are many who wish for peace. There, there are those who even march for it. And there, there are those who have talk shows that talk a lot about it. But often the ones who are doing all of this talking and marching have no humility. They have no self-denial. They don't have real love, which actually produces peace. In verse 20, he says, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it's evil for the man who eats with offense. Don't undo what God is doing in your brother by arguing over food or petty things. Take into consideration the estate of another man's conscience. But he goes on to say, it is good neither to eat meat, nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended, or is made weak. Again, I've had conversations in the past, and very often it's with young people in general, not necessarily young believers, who have said uh, to me, you know, if they're stumbled, that's their fault. If they're stumbled, that's their problem. Why should I live my life in accordance to the way they think? I wonder how many of us in this room would probably still think that way. I'm going to be true to myself. I've had people say, you know, I want to serve the Lord, but I, I don't want to live the kind of life that a pastor has to live because you can't do anything because people are always watching you. And I've argued and I've said, no, I can do anything I want. No, you can't. Oh, really? You can't drink. They've told me that. You can't drink. And I said, you've never seen me. <laughs> you can't drink. I used to start my Friday nights with a half gallon of wine and a quart of beer. And you're telling me I can't drink. Oh, I can drink. I don't want to drink. There's a difference. It's not that I can't go and have a beer, which I don't want. It's not that I can't. I could. But if you walked in and you saw your pastor drinking, I love you too much to do something stupid like that. And I don't like beer. That's another blessing. I don't care to. I don't want to. Because God changed my wants. And the want I have now is to serve him and to do so with a pure conscience and to be an example to believers. That's what Christians are supposed to be. Oh, you can't. Oh, yeah, I can, but I don't. And that's just that's what we're to do. It, it, in Philippians 2, it says in verses 3 and 4, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in loneliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look, look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. So don't destroy the work of God for the sake of poor, uh, the, the sake of food, rather. Um, in verse 21, again, it is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles. Don't do that because it stumbles a fellow believer. So verse 22 and 23, do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. So, do you have faith? If you have faith, the Lord gives you freedom to do that which is you're free to do in Christ. You're not, you're not in bondage. But at the same time, the freedoms that I have are not to be exercised at the expense of somebody else. Now, if I have faith, and this is an interesting thing he's saying here, um, then I'm to reserve my act of faith and exhibit that act of faith, if you will, before God. But don't exercise that act of faith in front of a weaker brother because it'll stumble him. Um, now, I'll, I'll, I'll go back because it's eating and drinking, and I'll, I'll go back to something uh, I became aware a long time ago, and some of you probably have too, I'd assume that, 
Now, you may think, well, you know, I just won't buy stuff from around here. I'll go somewhere else. You'd be surprised how many people know you. You will. Some of you have encountered this. I've had this happen so many times. I've, I've been in San Luis Obispo. I've been walking into a store, opening the door for the people walking out. You know, they're coming out, and I'm going in. And somebody turns to me and says, oh, pastor, you do like San Luis Obispo. People from my church. I've been in, I've been in beach areas that I've never been in my life. I've been walking with Marine friends, and I've had people walk up. Hi, pastor. I didn't know you come here. And, and I'm going, wow. And I've been on planes where stewardesses have said, I recognize his voice. Is that Pastor David? I've gone on planes where people have said, I was at church this morning. It was a great study. And I'm thinking, I can't go anywhere. <laughs> it, it, it's, a, it, it's just true. It's just true. And I enjoy it. So, no, I'm never really alone, <laughs> ever. So it's become easy for me to be aware of that. And you don't know how many people know you. You're on the worship team. And you're buying cooking wine. I've had Marie and me, we've been walking through stores in the local area with our shopping cart. And they've walked up to us. And they're looking in our cart. <laughs> Would you like to go with me and pay for this? What are you doing? I am not kidding. I've had them come to the table when we're eating. I have had it so many times. So it's a good thing. You don't do anything. Even if you had the freedom, you don't do it. And even if you do it at home where nobody's watching you, if you're a parent, you've got people watching you. You've got your children watching you. You know, when my kids were very small, I'll close with a couple things. When my kids were very small, we put them to bed at a certain time. And then I'd hear a little movement because Marie and I would watch whatever show we were going to watch. And I, they would climb out of their beds and crawl through the hall. <laughs> that was Marie. The kids were even <laughs> worse. Even worse. I'm telling you, you've got little eyes that are watching you at all times. Because whatever daddy does, whatever mama does is okay with God. And it'll be okay with me. Be aware of that. Whatever you do, they will do. So I made a choice a long time ago. I don't want them to ever blame me for the lack of faith they may have themselves. And so happy is the one who can eat and drink what he pleases with a clean conscience. And finally, in verse 23, we'll close. If he who doubts, he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. Whatever is not from faith is sin. Food by itself isn't the question. Whatever is not done in faith is sin because the conscience is violated. To try to eat with a weak conscience, all you're going to have is a sense of guilt. In Titus 1.15, to the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Even their mind and conscience is defiled. And so what you don't do in faith produces a guilty conscience. And so don't do anything that violates your conscience. And if you have a clean conscience, you're going to serve the Lord. If you have a, an impure conscience, you're going to be guilty and you'll probably shelve yourself because you won't feel the freedom to speak like I told you. And I'll close with the story everybody's heard, but I'll remind myself as I tell you this. Right in the same area of time when I was starting to return to taking social drinking and all, and I was sitting in a restaurant, and my friend was across from me, and he ordered a pitcher. And they brought this pitcher, and I poured some beer in it. Actually, he did. He poured it in for me. And I, I picked it up, and I saw an old, older gentleman. I was 23 or so. This older gentleman, was, he was old. He was probably 60. And he sat across from me. He wasn't, he wasn't um, eight feet away. He was right across from me, right there. Closer than the front row. And I picked up the beer and I drank it. Just a drink, just a drink, put it down. Two, this old man came, sat down, he saw me drink. And the spirit of the Lord spoke in a very, very firm way. Go share my love with that man. 
And I said, I can't. And I heard this prompting in my heart, why can't you? I said, because he saw me take a drink. He's of that generation that would really frown on that. So I said, he saw me take a drink. I, I can't. And as God is my witness, within a minute or so, two young men came off the, uh, into the door into this pizza parlor. One sat on one side of him, the other sat on the other. And I saw a guy pull out his Bible and opened it and started sharing the gospel with this man. I'll never forget this. And I'll never forget the impression of my heart when I heard, if I can't use you, I will use somebody else. And I said to myself, I want to be used by the Lord. Beer is not that important. People's salvation is. And that's was, that was the turning point in my life, to get right and straight with God. Because I never want to have to have somebody else take my place. I don't want to be in reserve. I want to be first string. And so I'm not going to sit the bench with my Bible. I want to be up on the field giving the word of God. That's me. I hope you're the same way. Because those things don't matter. What matters is their souls. That matters. My freedoms, I don't need if they're going to keep me from being able to talk about him. And so, whatever isn't done of faith is sin. Why? Because your conscience is violated. So don't do anything to violate your conscience. Live before the Lord with freedom. Father, we ask.